Let's go ahead and bring in Steiner Sports CEO, Brandon He's Steiner. One of the country's top He's memorabilia moguls. I have an unbelievable guest, Brandon He's Steiner. Brandon's second to none. Brandon Steiner here. How are you? And listen, I know I had to come to you early on a Friday, so wake the hell up now. <laughs> I know you were up late watching all those games, and you got, listen, you're going to have to do it again tonight, and then you have to do it again tomorrow and the next day. Don't get caught up in all that, okay? There's still a day's worth of work to be done. Anyway, I got a phenomenal guest, somebody that I've been following for the last year and a half, two years, dying to get her up here because I love her story, Megan Levy. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. So thank you for coming up. And your story is amazing. Obviously, I've got to start from the beginning. You know, why would you enlist in the Marines? I mean, <laughs> if my daughter came home and said, Dad, I'm going to go to, I'm going to enlist in the Marines. Yeah. I'm not sure if I have a heart attack or I don't know what I would do, but yeah. it, it, this how, how did this go down? How, we got to start kind of from the beginning sure. here. Well, uh, so I'm born and raised in New York. Uh, and honestly, pretty much 9-11 had a big impact on my life. That's one of the main reasons. Like, I graduated high school 2001, and I have late birthday. So my first year, I went to Cortland, SUNY Cortland, first year away at school. Love that school. Uh, you know, I uh, didn't really see much of the classrooms, but I loved it too. Okay, so it was <laughs> probably a, why I came it was back the next year. Yeah, um, but two months or yeah, two months into me being away from home for the first time, like away from my family, away from my friends, nine eleven happened. Right, so I'm seventeen year old kid at college, not really knowing anyone, and that was a really scary time. I remember waking up for class, like turning on the TV and being like, "Oh my god!" And my father, he just recently retired he's a teamster in the city so he travels all over the city so you know back then we didn't have cell phones and things like we did today yeah. so trying to call my pa my mom and dad you know and all the phone lines are busy it's just like what's going on what's happening and it's a, it was a really weird time I think and especially at that young age where you're kind of still don't even know who you are. What are you doing with it? So that life? weird time was like, let me go join the Marines? Well, what, what, what clicked in for you? No. I mean, obviously you felt connected sure. with, with everything going on, but something must have happened that says, you know, I'm going to go do this. Well, I grew up playing sports like all my life. Softball was like my main sport. Like I played travel softball, you know, I was like varsity when I was y like young in high school. Um, my second year, I played. I couldn't play because my grades were so bad at Cortland. But uh, my second year, I came back home. I played for St. Thomas Aquinas. And I just really grew up, like, loving playing for a team and, like, having that bond. Because I'm an only child. So I made most of my friends through sports. And, um, you know, after 9-11 happened, I just – I really didn't know what I wanted to do in college anyway. And I was like, you know what? This may not be a bad thing. And at the time – was kind of a little wild child back in the day, if you ask my parents. So I felt right. like... Define that a little bit. I mean, I mean, a little bit of detail. Sure. What that means. Like any kid, you know, probably partying more than I should, not going to school. Not disciplined, yeah. necessarily. Not disciplined at all, okay. right. And all I right. felt like, I don't want this to be my life. I need to, like, find something that I can't quit at. Like, school, I could quit. I did. I blatantly came home from winter break my first year and said, hey, mom and dad, I don't want to go back. They said, you're going back. I was like, all right, I'll show you. I'm just not going to school anymore. And um, I know in the movie it says like some, a friend of mine passed away that, that did happen. So that was kind of like another reason why I wanted to be around my friends from home. And I just almost in spite of my parents making me go back to school, was like, I'll show you. <laughs> was the movie honest? Was the movie accurate? The, how much input did you have to the movie? I know they try to dramatize these things sometimes, but what's your feeling overall? Just on a, We're going to talk more about the movie, but yeah. from a broad stroke. A broad stroke, I mean, it's honestly, it's based on. Uh, there's, there's things that are, you know, completely accurate, and then there's things that I would tell a story and they would come back, and I'd be like, no, 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 that's not... But, you know, you have to put it in perspective. You only have an hour and a half to fit a whole a lifetime. years of my life into a movie. So I think that the way that they went about doing it, they did a good job. So Okay, that's fair. Yeah. I think the entrepreneurial part, which is why I, I really want to bring you in here, because this mm -hmm. was not easy to do. I want to get to that in one second, because I just got to cover the Marines thing a little bit more. Sure. Like, 
you're, you're kind of a little all over the place. You decided to go in the Marines. How yeah. hard was that transition? I got to be honest with you. You got balls. Thank I mean, you. <laughs> are you kidding? I mean, because I always thought in my mind I would love to maybe go in the Marines or the Army. That And, and I just didn't have the balls to do it because right. the discipline, how hard it was going to be. And were you scared? I mean, and is it that hard? It, yeah, it's hard, but I, just the way that I am in my life in particular, I feel like I'm kind of extreme. Like if I'm going to do something, I'm going to like go all in and do it. Like, so my thought process kind of was if I am going to join the military, I'm going to go for the hardest branch. And I'm, you know, that's just it, it. That's how I am in general. I think that's just kind of part of my personality. Um, so when I joined, I didn't even tell my parents. I joined. That's a good way to not get your parents <laughs> upset. And I will never forget because it was it was in August of 2003, I believe, when we had that blackout in New York City. Yes. I don't know if you – so that's the day that I drove up. I was in Albany swearing in. The day I moved into my new house. Really? Blackout. Yeah. yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah. So driving home with my recruiter, <clears throat> I called my parents. I said, hey, I just joined the Marine Corps. And they – my mom was like, you know. What the, are you kidding? Like, excuse me? And uh, the the phone cut out and then, you know, the blackout. We had no reception. So I was like, I don't think I'm going to go home tonight. And I asked my recruiter if he could drop me off at a friend's house and I stayed out that night. <laughs> so how fast did you end up going? Like, like the oh next week gosh. kind of thing or a few no, weeks later? No, I swore in in August and they had said maybe a year. And I remember I was at a Thanksgiving with my family in Atlanta and I got a phone call from my recruiter in November saying, hey, can you leave in December? And I was like, yeah, the sooner the better. So. Where'd you go? Paris Island, South Carolina. That's where all the females now, go. Now, we, oh, is that where? Uh, is, That's the only female battalion. Okay. So there's, you can either go to MCRD San Diego. If you, if you live on the West Coast or like in that area, the males, they go to MCRD San Diego. Right. Like East Coast guys would go to Paris Island, South Carolina, but there's so few women in the Marines that we all just go to South Carolina because that's now the, were you in the kind of shape though but you were an athlete you mentioned yeah but, or was this a um I would well you're you're in like what they call a pooley program so it's kind of a program when when you sign up where you're a recruiter you meet like a couple times a week and you go to these things where you know they they run and they yeah. go over kind of like drill movements and things like that uh to kind of prepare you a little bit like with what you're going to be What's going to be thrown your way? Like ba very basic yeah. stuff. Was there one obstacle uh, in this? Whole, what was the biggest obstacle when you got into, when you started this program? What was the thing that really, that you had to work through? Um, honestly, I think it was more mentally challenging because, you know. It, Isn't everything though? Yes, I think so. Because, you know, yeah. working out, they work you up to the level that you need to be. Like they're not just going to come out and you'd be like okay you need to do all of this and honestly in boot camp even if you if you're the in the best shape in the world and you finish every obstacle or you do whatever you can do on time or the right way they don't care like they set you up to fail and that's the purpose of it like you know take off you know all your clothes in 10, 10 seconds 10 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 put them back on take them off put it back it's it's more of like a mental breakdown because no matter how hard you try with these tasks that they're giving you you're not going to get it done and they also they do that because then you know in the future in boot camp there are things that we go through that you need a partner you can't do it by yourself so that's how they kind of build the bond of teamwork and when you're a marine even like this is one thing people ask me about the bathrooms like the shower and the things like that people don't really know about at boot camp you have to request permission to go to the bathroom and you have to do it with someone else because they always want you to be with a partner you're never by yourself when you're because i mean go think about in war do you want to ever be alone somewhere no so you'll run up to the drill instructor with this and you have to find someone and they're like i don't want to talk to them they're scary so you have to find someone that's willing to like go with you, <laughs> which is not easy to do. And you'll request permission and they'll be like, go away. And you're like, oh my God, come on. And then, you know, you come back and they'll like, they'll let you go. And then they'll come in and they'll rip you right off like you're done. Ooh. I mean, like, Ooh. yeah, they really break you down in there. They break you down and you, you felt okay with that. Um, what's the what's your big takeaway from that whole experience? Before we talk about you going and uh, you know when you actually go to war, yeah. Uh, what was your big takeaway? Um, 
Oh, man, teamwork. I mean, I think as an individual, we go through life thinking, you know, we can, we're responsible for ourselves a lot of times, I think people people think. But sometimes in life, you need people to help you along the way. And sometimes you can't always do things on your own. You need a partner or a teammate or just someone yeah. there with you. So. Did you find that you, you got deployed and you're 100 missions? I mean, this is not, you were out there. Well, I did two, you know, I did two deployments. I did back to back. Because you didn't have enough, you had to go back. Well, or was it a choice or you had to go back? I mean, well, you're in the Marines, you don't really have a lot of choices. Okay. Good. <laughs> you kind of take orders and you do what you're told. I kind of feel like that's how it is for at home sometimes for me. So it, there you that, go. Would, that would have been good you preparation. You can relate. Yeah. But um, I, it's just hard to really understand how hard that is. I mean, you watch, you know, you watch movies, you see movies, but how hard is it being, you know, when you get deployed and you're there? Are you, is it, is it difficult as what you, what you think it is and dangerous? I think it's almost more or less like the first time I was there. I had no idea what to expect. Um, I went through like a year of school before I even got to Camp Pendleton where I was stationed. I did military police okay. school. I went to canine school and then I was eventually stationed at Camp Pendleton. And um, I, the, the way that I ended up getting Rex was there was no dogs available. Like, so I worked as a regular cop on the road for like seven months. And then a dog opened up because someone got out of the Marine Corps and I was like, amazing, I'm so happy. Um, then we certified as a dog team and then right away I was like, okay, cool, you're on the next rotation to go out there. Because at the time, um, dogs were in really high demand and it was kind of like right when the canine programs, not program, but it, they, we, they really started utilizing us in Iraq at that time. It was kind of new to a lot of the different branches of the military and to us. So um, I didn't really know what to expect. And I had only been with my dog for like four months. And then I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to Iraq. Okay, here we go. Let's pretend like we know what we're doing. Now your dog's name? <laughs> yeah, Rex. Rex. Yeah. You got this relationship with the dog. And mm -hmm. I guess this is where the movie comes into play uh, based on what, what's about to happen uh -huh. on this deployment. You've got this relationship with the dog. How important was that dog uh, t to this country? Yeah. And how important was that dog to you? I I will say he he was amazing. He was such a good working dog. Kept me and not just me, like I would be that's what I'm saying. Like you gotta really pretend if you don't know what you're doing, you have to act like you do and you have to really trust that dog because that dog knows what it's doing and you have to be able to listen and understand and pick up on cues because there's all these people behind you that are counting on you to keep them safe. And that's what bomb, Rex is doing. out bombs and things like that. Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. Now, where's the movie come into play here? Why the movie uh, has that come into play? Like, come how did it come about? Yeah. Um, well, when I got out of the Marine Corps, Rex was only, I believe, about six years old. So I knew that um, he was also non-deployable. So after we got hurt on our second deployment, um, I had about a year left in the Marine Corps and Rex. How hurt were you? I, I mean, pretty bad. Like I spent the last year doing physical therapy, but with him too, he had a bad injury. So we kind of went through it together. Um, plus nobody else could really touch him. And <laughs> so I had to, you know, be the one to go to all his physical therapy appointments, MRI appointments, take him to the vet, all that stuff. Um, so, and then it was nice because I kind of got to work with the new Marines that were like about to go on deployment and kind of explain to them what to expect. Like we started training with gear, which we didn't really do before. Um, and not just me, me yeah, and, yeah, yeah, sure. you know, um, other Marines. You got very tight with his dog. Yeah. You and Rex were. Mm -hmm. I used to, I used to take him out of, cause we have a kennel facility on Camp Pendleton and that's where the dogs live. And then we live in the barracks or if you're married or you live off base with your wife or husband or whatever um but i lived in the barracks and i used to <laughs> i used to take him and uh bring him to my barracks room which was definitely not allowed but i would just say hey guys uh i'm taking rex so if anyone asks like uh, you know obviously give me up like i'll take i'll get in trouble for it but just so you know don't go like telling oh my god the dog's missing like i'm letting you guys know i'm taking him but no one would really check anyway okay. and 
Um, so I'd bring him to my room and he would stay with me in my barracks room. And then I'd go in early in the morning and bring him back before everybody got in. So, so tight. I know people tight. knew that I did it. It was kind of like they just yeah. looked the other way. You guys were tight. Um, the movie comes about and how, how hard was it to put this movie it took four years for this movie to actually get made. Like, I didn't was know. It your, was it your idea, though? Or no. I So when I got out of the Marines, I, I knew, like, first of all, Rex was not good at the vet. And that was, like, the main concern was he had not adoptable in big, bold letters written in his medical record. And, you know, when you adopt these dogs out, they have to go through, um, like, a series of tests to see, which is a necessary process, I totally get to make sure yeah. they're, you know, suited to the right person and to be adopted and everything. But at the same time, these dogs also cost a lot of money. They're a big, you know, deal in the military. So I can't take a six-year-old dog that still maybe has, you know, two or three good years. Even though if he's not deploying, he's still working on base. Like, we still do our duties aboard Camp Pendleton, like military police. And, um, you know, they're not going to waste that money and just be like, oh, yeah, here, here's a dog. I, I, I get that. So I knew that I was going to kind of probably have to wait at least a little bit. But my big concern was that not adoptable because they wouldn't sign off on the paperwork. Um, he was he was an aggressive dog. Oh. Um, but, you know, a lot of dogs are aggressive and they weren't with him 24 seven like I was like I took a trip up to New York City. We did the U.N. General Assembly um, and I stayed in a hotel with him. He was fine. He's met my friends and family. Cool. He was good with other dogs. He just was super aggressive at the vet, which I was, I'm a vet technician or I, I you know, I was. So I mm-hmm. get it. Dogs, they don't like to be at the vet. But I mean, that is also a big deal. So. How'd you get a change, by the way? How'd you get him? How'd you? <laughs> well, I had to wait four years and I'm almost lucky that he was non-deployable because that was our main mission out of Camp Pendleton. So Rex went through 12 different handlers after me and he was kind of always somebody's secondary dog because they were deploying with like their main dog. So nobody liked him, like nobody bonded with him like I did, which almost like was good in my favor. And I always kept tabs on him, like how is he? Um, So I got a call one day and they were like, hey Rex, pretty much uh, had like a seizure or a stroke and he ended up with some neurological issues. So at this time he's 11 years old (laughs) and that's old for a dog. I'm lucky that I even got the opportunity to adopt him because I don't know, like you don't know how big, how long he's going to live for. So that was really like, you know, hard for me to deal with all those years like You know, you can't explain to an animal, like, I'll be back. Like, I told him, I'll be back for you. I'll try try my best. And and I did. And when I got this call from someone that he was sick, he could be euthanized because he has medical issues. He's also an 11-year-old dog that's not adoptable. It's just not a good candidate for, you know. Would you say you were relentless in this pursuit uh, at the the end to get this to happen? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, watching some different things from the movie, like mm-hmm. you get the Purple Heart, which, you know, congratulations and thank you. For, thank you so much for your service. And, and that's an amazing, that's amazing. But do you feel like the dog didn't get its due? Um, I wish that I could have adopted him sooner to kind of, I wanted to give him the life that I thought he earned um, as a retired Because he was a war hero. Dog. He did three tours in Iraq. Injured in his last one. Yeah, he, he he worked. I mean, he worked till he couldn't work anymore. And I understand that that is their job. But, you know, at the same time, you just have this bond with them. And I just wanted him to live a good end of his life. Like, I thought he deserved that. And if he's sick in a kennel and just to be euthanized, I just felt like if he's sick and he's in pain, I understand. But... Just give me the opportunity to let him let him have a happy end of his life. Like that's all I wanted. And it's not so much the the process takes time. So I think where I went about was I rushed that process by kind of I, you know, I actually first went to a man named Jerry Janellen who is he's retired now too, but he helped all the local veterans. He was like like the VA guy. And I went to him crying, and he ended up knowing a woman that worked in Senator Schumer's office, 
and we put up a whole packet together and sent it over and I think you know any politician probably would see this and be like oh good you know this is a good human interest story why not so I'm lucky enough a great that human story. I'm lucky enough that he you know kind of put that out in the press and then it was it kind of widely life, known to take a life onto itself oh yeah and I was not prepared for that from a media standpoint or yeah and, and people asking questions and all of a sudden that's how the movie kind of popped up too yes I didn't know like when they did the press release no one told me hey there's going to be a press release today so I got totally blindsided with all these phone calls like what's happening and I'm like oh my god how do they know this I guess it went out so that was a lot for someone that does is not in the spotlight doesn't isn't you know and how'd you deal with that? I mean, was it just kind of learning just on the fly? Just kind of was coach you a little bit? On, or? No, I just, just was kind of honest. And all I wanted was my dog. I love the Marine Corps. It wasn't, I wasn't trying to yeah. pick a fight with the Marines. I get the whole process. But bottom line was I just wanted my dog. And he was sick. And I know that he was old and he didn't have a lot of time. And if anything could help that process, hurry up. You know, and, and it did. That's fair. It did. And that's how it caught the attention of... Randy Levine and Mindy Levine from the Yankees. Who did they help facilitate this? They it's just this movie ended up somehow yeah. getting kind of intertwined a little bit with in the Yankee world. Yes, which is such a small. Such it a it small comes full world. circle because I also worked. Mindy's a gem. I, yeah, I love a gem. her. Gem. I mean, she takes a hole of something. That's it. Yeah, I mean they've they've become family to me, and I worked at Yankee Stadium with my other bomb dog Patriot before they even knew me. So I would see Randy come in every day, like before the games and check his car and little, de- and I, when you're a canine handler, nobody knows your name, they, but everybody knows your dog's name. No question. Yeah, so right. everybody would know Rex, everybody would know Patriot, but they would never know Megan. <laughs> so it's so funny, because when I finally met Randy and Mindy in person, I told them this and they were like, oh, Patriot. Like they, now, Randy they Levine, knew. president of the New York Yankees. Yes. Um, and if, you know, for Yankee fans, a lot of Yankee fans out there, but if not, I mean, it's, he's a pretty big name. I mean, as far as not only is he uh, obviously, you know, running one of the biggest teams in all of sports, mm-hmm. but he's also a very influential guy in New yeah. York in, in a lot of ways in the political circles and, you know, a big part of getting the New York Yankee stadium up. And mm-hmm. he's just an amazing guy. I mean, I'm a fan just because I know Yankee Stein doesn't exist <laughs> without a Randy Levine. He's right. the one who really was the orchestrator. So I'm very grateful to him. And and Mindy's, uh, you know, her heart is just the heart of gold. Yeah. So when they, they, they take on projects like this, and it's amazing how they connected. And I remember Mindy calling me up one yeah. day to tell me the whole story, and I was trying to get my arms around it. Oh, it's, there's a lot. So it's very that emotional. Goes into it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, when you look back, though, do you think that. Because, you know, the stereotype. I'm always trying to get my arms around, like, what it's like for a woman. You know, my mom was a very powerful mm-hmm. lady. Yeah. So I, I took a lot of good uh, cues from her. And yeah. She always, she really had never w- wanted to get caught up in the uh, the, the male-female thing. She's yeah. always like, females are just, you know, they're just better than men. <laughs> just, 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 we're just better. But we'll let you all have this one. But And, and dead serious about it, by the way. But yeah. is there room in the military? Is, have they even things out? Because... Every time you read something, it's, it seems a little off. But have, have they even things out now for women? Is is it now a little more of a, a, an opera? Is it more of an easier place to environment for a woman to succeed? I mean, who said it wasn't ever? Has, has you feel it's always <laughs> been that way, or um, I I can mm. only speak for myself personally. I can't speak for yeah, anybody it's else. Fair. Um, I never had a problem. She had a good run. You were yeah, fairly but also you know, growing up, I was like one of the guys, so. Going into the Marines wasn't necessarily like a really big change for me. Um, I feel like if you treat people with respect and you kind of do what you're told and, you know, try to do the best you can at your job, regardless if you're a man or a woman, people are going to, you know, like you and gravitate towards you. And, you know, there could be a guy that, you know, has an attitude or yeah so I, I don't necessarily think it's a man woman type of thing sure there's a lot less women in the military in general and especially in the marine corps um but i don't know i i also you know met a lot of you know cool girls in the marines that i liked as well i just that whole man women thing never was really like a not, top issue not for an me issue. Now, I assume you, you, you cut off that beautiful blonde hair 
that, that. Do you want to know that's the first question I asked my recruiter? Do I got to cut my hair? Because it would have been the first question I had to ask because I had a really long. And he's. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, there's no way I'm giving this hair. <laughs> Obviously, the good Lord had different. Uh, I different swear to God, I walked about. into the recruiting station and, <laughs> and which they have to keep a quota. So when a girl comes in, they're like, oh, we have to get her. It's hard. And I, the first question I asked was, do I have to cut my hair if I join? And he said, no, you can wear it in a bun. I said, okay. Oh, really? So that's yeah. cool. That was a good little sidestep there. Yeah. Now, um, the movie was a, was a big deal. Are you doing a book? Or are you? What's next for you um, on this sort of thing? I yeah. am, and I actually. By the way, we're we're talking. Listen, Megan is. Yeah. You got to go watch this movie, and also just a quick thing: if people mm-hmm. want to get a hold of you and stuff, like, what's the best way? Email because I can keep track of things a lot easier. I feel like when I'm not a social media person. No, I I, I am a social media. Uh, I am. Uh, I mean, I have a Facebook, I have an Instagram, and I have a Twitter. Am I as active as probably everyday people? No, I kind of, I feel like people get really caught up in social media, which is great. And, you know, it's awesome. But I also try to experience things like in the moment. So I'm not always the person that's you're not walking around live taking streaming. selfies. No, yeah. I'm I'm actually taking it all in. Like here, like sure. Ben, ben we have to get a selfie, by the I'm way. I'm definitely gonna take pictures. A selfie, like I'm definitely gonna over. take pictures and yeah. stuff when you know we're done with everything. Yeah, but I'm fine. I'm just I probably should be a little bit more active on my social media. But um Well we'll help you with that. You <laughs> should be. You you have a great story and I think Thank you can you. inspire others and, and I think it would be there are probably a lot of people that you can kind of give a lot of help to without necessarily having a, you can't meet them all. But yeah. you know, on social media, you can pop up, do a live you know, Skype or a quick little. Yeah, and, I, and I mean, I get yeah. messages a lot, yeah. you know, in my Instagram and my Facebook. And um, a lot of them are from younger girls, which is really nice. Like, oh my gosh, can we do my class project on you? Or yeah. things like that. And I really try my best to answer people. You know, you can't, like you said, you can't answer everybody, but yeah. I, I really do try to at least say thank you to people that reach out to me to show their Are you doing some speaking? Are you doing some I am, speaking? yeah, right, and that's out. been really cool. I I like that. Where, where, where have you been? Uh, anything anything notable, that you, any groups that you've uh, enjoyed more than others? Yeah, it's I, I've done some things. I'm part of the Military Order of the Purple Heart organization in Rockland County. Um, so they've had uh, like their annual dinner. I was a keynote speaker there this year. And uh, schools, I, yesterday I was just at Felix Festa, Middle school where my friend wow. went over there went um, had an assembly with them and uh, high schools and I've been uh, working with Royal Canin and Yukonuba the dog food brand uh, they made me their brand ambassador so I got to go to a lot of cool I went to the AKC National Championship dog show in Orlando over the winter that's cool and uh, they brought me out to Ohio where they have their plant where they make all their food and things like that and I was just in Florida um, doing a keynote speaking engagement for their like annual meeting so I've been working with them a lot and it's been fun because I get to talk about you know my my experiences and dogs which I love as well so how does it feel like to have a you know, this kind of recognition uh, to have a movie made about something that you've experienced really firsthand. Yeah. And also, how does it feel to have a purple heart? I mean, what's that mean? What's it that, hurt. What, what does that mean? <laughs> it hurt? <laughs> it was painful? <laughs> um, I, I, it's, I, it's kind of a weird award because I feel like when people are like, oh, congratulations, it's like, thanks, I didn't die, <laughs> you know, so. But you did, you did uh, almost, and, and in some respects, you did put your life on the line. Right, yeah. Um, which no, people it, I are mean, grateful for, you know, they're, they're thankful for that, as I am. I mean, you put your life on the line in many ways, many times. Thank you. And, you know, injury, injury was unfortunate, but then, you know, we, we want recognition for that. And do you actually know that my original Purple Heart that I was issued was stolen out of my barracks room? No. Yeah. Why would someone steal your Purple Heart? Because people are, you know. Isn't it pers- is it personalized, the Purple Heart, or is it unilateral? Kind of they're all the same. It's in a case. Like, so it was it was cased. And I had gone uh, home to New York on leave for a week. And when I came back, it was stolen out of my barracks room. Wow. Yeah. It's like, hey, you know, Ben, did I tell you I have a Purple Heart? I, mean, I like, who does this? Oh, kind of my thing? kennel master called like, the whole meeting, and I mean, I had to file a police report. Yeah, everybody yeah. was pissed yeah. in my section, but you know, turning something really bad into something even better is when um, I had a ceremony when I finally did adopt Rex and got him back. 
they had a ceremony for me on the field at Yankee Stadium before one of the games. And as a surprise to me, they re gave me a purple heart. Like they gave wow. me a new one on the field at Yankee Stadium. So I love that. And it was a total surprise to me, and it, which was funny because I think people saw Marine walking out and I like put my hands up like to my face because I, I was so surprised. I think people thought he was proposing because it's in a case. <laughs> <laughs> did was, you think that? No, I didn't okay. know the guy. It was a stranger. Right, it was, was like just, saying, just a maybe some guy, you know, Yankee <laughs> no. Stadium. Listen, they always say amazing, great things happen in Yankee Stadium. This and, you is know, true. Maybe they, right? But, you know, what's great about the Yankee thing also is there is our long history of their connection with the military and respect they're for it. They're super And I know they, they have a lot of teams now that jump on that. But, you know, Mr. Steinbrenner was on that early. Yeah. And in and, and a very respectful, consistent way, which I love. You, because when you're at the stadium, you can feel it. I love the seventh inning when they bring the veterans yeah. out and they sing. Yeah, oh, I love it's that. It's the best. Some of the traditions that they've started. Like, is I get amazing. goosebumps when yeah. I am there and watch that happen. And, right. I mean, just to have my dog and me on the field and my family watching with all those people was just so cool. Probably one of the most like memorable experiences that I've had. It is amazing, and they don't just let anybody pop on the field. No, do they that. don't. You know, they're very selective and picky that they're that they're important moments. And it was and very important. My dog was muzzled because wow. you know we couldn't risk any of the players getting injured <laughs> oh, <laughs> by that, an accidental bite. <laughs> if anything, they would have bit some of the visiting players, which we don't <laughs> we don't mind. But um, what is next for you? I mean, where do you go from here? Um, and is there more to be done? Yeah. As far as you know, your mission and your purpose? Sure. Well, um, you mentioned a book ear earlier, which I think is kind of cool that I am working on a book. And I kind of like the fact that it's coming out after the movie because the movie is, of course, based on my experiences. But in the book, I can kind of be a little bit more like real, real life. And detailed. And, and not even just, you know, what was in the movie. I'm kind of going into my experiences after the movie and like I think people are interested in like like you just said how does that change your life and well you know because I could tell you a billion stories that are because you got to be a cool I mean just from a guy's <laughs> standpoint I, I just think you're got to be a really cool person to like hang out with thank you I, I, like, I, I like I mean, to think so <laughs> oh you got the sports thing military first of all anybody messes with me I'm just gonna have you beat them up or something and <laughs> so I feel safe and secure and, and I mean think about it like that you're you got the whole thing going I've had on, a lot no? of cool experiences that, you know, I could, I, we only have so much time in this podcast, but that's exactly what the book's for. Cool stories that have just, that I've come across through, you know, this happening to me yeah. in my life and having a movie made and being able to go to all these different places and meet different people. And, you know, some stuff's funny. Some stuff is like, wow, you can't make that up. But it's, it's, it's been an experience and I'm trying to, just make the best of it. Your parents, I, I got to give them a lot of credit here. Thank because you. From going, first of all, I mean, it, you know, to just going to the military. Yeah. Then I'm sure when you got injured, I'm sure that wasn't a happy day. No, they no. had to be flipped out. Yeah, sure. And then just the kind of work you were doing is so dangerous. Yeah, I, I did remember. Did you pick that type of work? I mean, did you pick that? To, I didn't with, even know there was a canine field until I was in military police school, and they had a canine handler come in and talk to our class. And then I realized they had told you, you have to finish in the top of your class. You have to get selected. You have to write an essay. You have to do all this stuff and essentially get chosen to go to canine school. And I won the board. So you, you, you couldn't finish a semester of college. And then now you're in a class yeah. and then top of your class. Yes. That's a nice swing. But your purpose behind that, you, you had interest. You were committed. And Boom. I've grown up with animals and dogs. I don't think there's ever been a point in my life, including now, where I haven't had a dog, a cat, any like some type of pet. So when they said canine, I was like, oh, my God, I love to. I've, I've grown up to, around dogs my whole life. So that really, like, appealed to me. Now, Kate Mara played you in the movie. Yeah. Did she spend time with you? Did you guys hang out a little bit to, so that she really understood where you were coming from? I met with her in the city one time, and I got to go through, like, show her kind of pictures of my friends and my dog and some pictures from my deployments and just people that were important yeah. in my life. Um, and then... I got to go to South Carolina. They did a little bit of filming there for a couple of days where I did my little cameo appearance or whatever. And, uh, you know, I was there with her. But um, I think she did a pretty good job playing me. Cool. Yeah. I think, I mean, I thought she did a good performance. Yeah, I, th I think so too. That's cool. Ben, any questions from out there that we need to address or anything I've missed? Um, just a bunch of different people asking about your favorite memories with Rex. Oh, man. 
God. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of really good memories with Rex. He was such a funny dog. I just, he would honestly get into mischief, but it was, it was funny. But also, I will say, probably one of the things I'm most grateful for about Rex was when we were deployed, um, I would deploy, or I would go out on missions with different units, Army, Navy, Marines, you know, not Marines that I knew or anybody. So when they would request a dog team, most people were picturing a guy and a dog. So I would roll up to these meetings and, you know, if it was with an infantry unit or, you know, they're not used to being around females, they would be like, everybody would turn super quiet. Yeah. And it would be uncomfortable. And then they would be like, can we curse around you? Like, they didn't want to get in trouble. Like, so I credit Rex being a really good icebreaker because, like, you know, I'd be standing in the corner with my dog and one of them would be like, hey, can I pet that dog? And I'd be like, sure, his name is Rex. And then they kind of got a feel for me as a person and felt a little bit more comfortable. And then them seeing him actually work. And he was real mean, so Marines like that, like tough and mean. And they started requesting me because I didn't complain. My dog worked really well, and he scared people. So I really credit him. Was with- it was it that, was it kind of that way out there when you were out there with the dog? I mean, because it's hard for us to imagine. Mm-hmm. Are you in that kind of confrontational uh, mode a lot of times during those deployments? Was it that was it that kind of confrontation? What do you mean with, well, uh, with like the with, Iraqi people? Yeah, or or, or potential or just. You know, you never know. All of a sudden, somebody's driving up, like you see in the movie. Somebody yeah. drives up with a car, and it looks, and then boom. It's super tense. Um, and I think, you know, everyone's always really aware. They say complacency kills, which is true. You always have to, like, expect the worst, you know? Um, be on top of your A game. Always be aware of your surroundings and, you know, always be, like, know you're with people and what's going on. Every, communication is really key. So. You know, that's a big deal. But, yeah, Rex was a really – I credit him to me kind of getting intertwined with the people I worked with out in Iraq and them actually respecting me and, like, treating me, like, as kind of their equal, even though I wasn't in their units per se. But, um, you know, they, they liked working with me, and I, I think that was really cool. And just when I got to get him home, I had two cats. I had another dog. And uh, just him experiencing weird things like – cooking in the kitchen like he never smelled human food before so that was like a big thing he's never seen deer my cats oh my gosh he went after my cats like as soon as he saw them and one of them just like smacked him in the nose and then he was like okay got it no big deal wow <laughs> so, so he, he was yeah he was special mm-hmm. he was not a typical and i just think a lot of the a lot of the alone time that i got with him in iraq just us you know wherever we were living in, in like a trailer or in a tent or camping out wherever and then bringing him back to my barracks room, all those like alone moments and just kind of getting to know him and whatever I was maybe going through in my personal life, it was like a calming factor to have him there. He was like your right hand. Yeah. Right? It or my like left you, if you want to be yeah, typical you guys are about tight. it. I mean, because it, it seemed like you guys were so tight. At least the movie portrayed that. Yeah. By the way, um, when you have a dog like that, mm-hmm. I mean, are you able to kind of give the dog extra treats? Are you able to kind of do, extra, you know, things like that? Well, once he was retired, special benefits? sure. But, but while in service, though, are you able to kind of? Um, you know, it's they have a purpose. So, yeah, like every now and again, if it was like their birthday or something, we would slip them like some steak or, you know, we would bring some chicken down to the kennels. Like, you know, you don't announce it to people. But, sure, sure. Um, you know, his reward was a ball. So you can't really play with them like a pet. Like you can a little bit like, you know, with different things just to exercise them and and whatever. But you don't want to like overload them with toys because then it becomes not special. And that's not that's their motivation to work as they their drive is they want that toy. Like it's a game for them. Essentially, they they work to find, you know, the explosives or narcotics or whatever they're looking for. They give a response and they get rewarded. So you want them to have that drive to make it really like extra special to get that reward. Cool. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing. Um, by the way, following the Yankees, you have a feeling about this team this year? Oh, man. You excited? Uh, am I excited? Will you be there opening day? Of course I will. Wow. <laughs> I, so you're hyped up. 
Yeah, I mean, I went all the way to Houston last year for the very last game. You were there. Yeah, I was there right behind the dugout. So I had bruises close. on my hands. I had no voice. Um, for I was at, at every single playoff game last year with Cleveland and so Houston. So you're feeling this team right now. Yeah, I, I got to say, the home games, if we were at home that last Houston game, in my opinion, we would have been going to the World Series. Just – um, I, I haven't had that feeling in the stadium. Like this, this past year was a special year. Who's and, your favorite? Um, who, who do you? Who, who's your a couple of favorite guys? I, 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 I do have a couple of favorites. I, I like Brett Gardner. I think he's like a good veteran of the team, and I like that. I feel like he leads by example. He plays hard. He's been on the team forever. Obviously, Judge is an easy go-to. Yeah, of course. You know everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. everybody he, and I, I really, I respect his. That's. I, I'm thinking just of things that have gotten thrown at me, and I'm nowhere even at his like celebrity level. Being a new guy, a young kid in New York City, I think he's handling the press and the media and the attention really well. So I give him a lot of credit for that. Um, but yeah, I just you know I don't want to talk too much because I know <laughs> I've become really superstitious being around everybody in the Yankees. Oh, and yeah, you can't talk about. This I mean, if someone here. hits a home run or there's like a streak going on, Randy will be like, "Stay there." Don't move. So we, I, uh, I don't want to say too much because I, I don't want to jinx anything or put my foot in so my I'll mouth. So I'll see you at but, the stadium a bunch this oh year. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. I, it's literally my second home during the spring and, is and that the your summertime. Number one sport, or you watch some other sports too? Are you into some other? What, Baseball what? is definitely my number one sport. Like I said, I played softball growing yeah. up, so I just. What I position, have, by the way? I played second base and pitcher. Fast pitching? Yeah. Like the wind. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a peak. Oh yeah. No, what I was didn't your, know. What, what was your What was your go to pitch? Uh, you got the changeup going, curveball? the curve. You yeah, they're all going. Yeah, and Corlin's pretty competitive. That, that was like that's so you must have had some game. Well, Corlin, I didn't really get to play because I was on okay. academic probation. Yeah. But, but you but must have had some game. I though. played second base when I was at uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Are you surprised how popular now women's softball is? On, even on ESPN, you see those crowds there. No, because well, maybe I, I loved it. I always, you know, I think I, it's amazing. My wife thinks something's wrong with me. I'm watching like you're watching women's softball. And I said, honey, look how many people are in the stands. I mean, I'm not alone here. Yeah, he's on ESPN. Yeah, that's how I live my summer. The games are really good as a kid. The games are really good too. Yeah, yeah. I, I loved it. I mean, I the, some of my best friends I've made on the softball field that I'm still friends with to this day. So, and we used to play travel ball together. So I would play against them in high school and in college. And you know, I'm like, oh, I know how she plays. Like, you get all the inside info for yeah. everybody. But um, but yeah, so well, baseball's probably you. my number one. I'd First say. of all, thank you. For your Thank service. you. This was really fun. Thanks for I having me on. I appreciate you, and, and and also the respect for dogs. You know, you yeah. said you said you know it, it was a big message, which was warranted, but it was a big message for you to, you know, make that kind of statement, have that kind of focus to, to repay the you know to give the dog the re proper respect, which we all need to do with our animals. Yeah. Frankly. You know, we all need to pay a little more love and attention to our animals. There's mm -hmm. too many too many dogs and too many shelters, too many people mishandling pets. Yeah. And this kind of attention is a good thing. Yeah. And not to mention, you know, the commitment. I mean, I, I mean, I got to tell you, man, I don't know. I mean, not easy. Just, oh, I'm going to Marines. You deploy you there. <laughs> I mean, listen, I got to give you credit. I mean, you got a lot. Of, I mean, you're pretty fearless. Thank you. Yeah, that's pretty I, cool. That's, that's a nice compliment. I brought a gift for you. You I did? I know you're a Dolphin fan. Ah! So we got you uh, <laughs> Little Dan Marino. <gasps> no, did you? Love that. And, oh my uh, god. Also there's a couple of dolphins on there, Mercury Morris and uh Bob Greasy. Oh my god. A couple of dolphins. My mom there, is yeah. from Florida. That's how this so, that's how I became cool. a dolphin fan. She is gonna be so jealous of me. So it's kinda cool. So if we enjoy this and <gasps> Thank uh, you so much. Oh my god, so this is so cool. Something kinda cool, right? Thank, but thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I appreciate everything and um, if you haven't watched this movie, it, it's, it's worth it. it. It's so many great messages in the movie. And that's what I love about it is, you know, sometimes a message, uh, there's a, one message in a movie. Yeah. There's multiple messages about, you know, for, for, for girls, for women, uh, a little under, more understanding about what it's like to be in the military. Mm -hmm. And then also this, you know, this respect and connection with the dog. Yeah. It's just fascinating. And my big thing was, like, I always say, don't give up on something that you love. Like, don't give up. Like, my... I never gave up on getting Rex back and, and I got him back and then look at all the good that came out of it. And I my big thing was if I can help another person make it a little bit easier for them to adopt their dog once, you know, he's he or she is done or retired, like that's great. That that really makes me feel good. So I'm happy. I cool. you know, I'm happy.
about Look forward that. to having you back when you come out with the book. Good luck Thank with the you. book. I think it's going to be great to even get in more of the detail. Yeah. I love the There'll movie. Definitely be we'll, some good stories in there for sure. When do you think you have it done by? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. I I mean, these things take time. Yeah. So within a year or two, I'm hoping. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, we're here to help you if you can. Thank Thanks you so for much. Joining.